does uh, not project, you see. Jung puts the burden squarely on each person. And this psychology of individuation, of making what you are, and what you've inherited of the universe, of making that specific, of making what you've got of the collective in you, making that individual, and carrying it as an individual, and not only standing still in it, but allowing an act of becoming in the midst of your being to become your own way of moving through life. This is the hardest thing you can ask of human beings. And what would you say the main value of the research and the writing that you and Jung have done on alchemy is? I would say that a civilization needs a myth to live. We know that if missionaries destroy the myth of a primitive people, they, they destroy them also physically. They begin to drink, they degenerate, they are lost. And no civilization can live only from welfare. It needs, it needs a myth to live. All civil, great civilizations, when they were flourishing, had a living myth. And I think that the Christian myth on which we have lived has degenerated and has become one-sided and insufficient. And I think that alchemy is the complete myth. And that therefore, if our civili Western civilization has a, a possibility of survival, it would be by accepting the alchemical myth, which is a completion and continuation, but and richer completion of the Christian myth. That's a myth we could live, ag live again with. The psychology of individuation has nothing to do with politics at all, because it deals with the ultimate values. But yes, it has shattering political implications. And I think we are not now. We cannot behave as if this journey into the collective unconscious hasn't happened. Because it has happened, we can't plead ignorance anymore. It has happened, and because it's happened, because we are face facing a universe within, objective universe within, as great as the universe without, we can never be the same again. We cannot ignore it. And it has enormous political consequences for us. And the kind of society, the, the kind of politics that will save us, will have to be where more important than any other quality in our polit politicians. We will must demand psychological illumination, psychological awareness, because otherwise we get people sparring with their own shadows. Otherwise you get nations as we had in 1939, like the Germans projecting their shadows onto the Jews, and then when they were eliminating the Jews onto the Poles and God knows what not else, you see. And Jung often said to me, he said, the human being who starts by withdrawing his own shadow from his neighbor is doing work of immense, immediate political and social importance. What, what you would call the personal shadow of people didn't upset him. He just grumbled and cursed a bit, but that's not the problem of evil. It's that major evil of complete destruction which worried him. Mm -hmm. And his real approach to that was the inner work yes. that he did. The only thing you can do to confront yourself with it where you are. All the rest, all the benevolent, if benevolent preaching would help, then we would be out of the trouble long ago, because we have, we get a lot of benevolent and reasonable preaching, but it doesn't help. So the only place where you can really put the hand on it and deal with it body to, to body, the problem of evil is in yourself. And there you have to, the hope to change something, but the hope to change the world is a, is a childish illusion. As we've seen the collectivist pattern taking over all over society, the, the paradox is you get a form of totalitarianism which is producing collectivism, then you get a, a kind of creation of greater, greater monopolies of commerce.
bigger and bigger business, producing a kind of organization man, which is the equivalent of the totalitarian organization man, where, the, where this individual thing disappears. And really, this kind of individu uh, this kind of politics of individuation, which you might call democracy, ceases to exist. And this is the point where we have reached, we've reached at the moment. And at this point, all that's inferior, which Jung used to call the shadow, in man tends to come to the surface. The world hangs on a thin thread. Yeah. And that is the psyche of man. Yeah. Nowadays, we are not threatened by elementary catastrophes. There is no such thing as an age bomb. Yeah. That is all man's doing. Yeah. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? See? And <coughs> so you see, it is demonstrated to us in our days what, what the power of the psyche is of man, how important it is to know something about it. But we know nothing about it. No, nobody would, uh, would give credit to the idea that uh, the psychical uh, uh, processes of the ordinary man have any importance whatever. One thinks, Oh, he has just uh, what he has in his head. It is all from his surrounding. He's taught such and such a thing, believes such and such a thing. And particularly if he's well housed and well fed, then he has no ideas at all. Yeah. And that, that's the great mistake. Yeah. Because he is just that as which he is born, and he is not born as Tabula Rasa, but, but as, as a reality. Yes. 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 Jung had a vision at the end of his life of a catastrophe. It was a world catastrophe. I don't want to speak much about it. One of his daughters took notes and after his death gave it. And there's a drawing with a line going down, up and down and underneath is the last 50 years of humanity. And, and some remarks about the final catastrophe being ahead. But I have only those notes. Mm -hmm. What is your own feeling about it, the, the world well, situation? Well, one's whole, one's whole feeling revolts against this idea. But since I have those notes in a drawer, I, I don't allow myself to be too optimistic. I think, well, we have always had wars and enormous catastrophes, and. I, ha I have no more personal fear much about that. I mean, at my age, if you, ha you have any how soon to go, so or so or so, it egocentrically spoken. But, but the beauty of all the life, uh, to think that the billions and billions and billions of years of ev evolution to build up the plants and the animals and the whole beauty of nature, and that man would go out of sheer shadow foolishness and, foolishness and destroy it all. I mean, that all life might go from the planet. And we don't know. On Mars and Venus, there's no life. We don't know if there's any life experiment elsewhere in the galaxies. And we go and destroy this. I think it's so abominable. I, I, I try to pray that it may not happen, that a miracle happens. Do you find that uh, young people that you see now are aware of that, that, that in, it's in their consciousness? Yes, it's it partly in their unconscious and partly in their consciousness. And I think in a very dangerous way, namely in a way of giving up and running away into a fantasy world. You know, you, when you study science fiction, you see there's always the fantasy of escaping to some other planet and begin anew again, which means give up the battle on this earth. Look, uh, consider it hopeless and give up. I think one shouldn't give up. Because if you think of answer to Job, if man would wrestle with God, if man would tell God that he shouldn't do it, 
if we would reflect more. That's why reflection comes in. Jung never thought that we might do better than just possibly sneak around the corner with not too big a catastrophe. When I saw him last, he, he had also a vision while I was with him. But there he said, I see enormous stretches devastated, enormous stretches of the earth. But thank God it's not the whole planet. I think that if not more people try to reflect and take back their projections and take the opposites within themselves, there will be a total destruction. Wearing the mask, folks. Wearing the mask. Not the kind of mask I usually like to wear because, you know, I'm Batman. But, however, did I sound like the, um, did I sound like the adults on the Charlie Brown cartoons? I was just wondering, like, mm, mm, mm. remember the, uh, on the Charlie Brown cartoons, the adults I was, always used to sound like, mm, mm. I figure that you guys, when we're doing lectures, that's what you're hearing coming out of my mouth anyway, is, is some variation on that. But we're talking about discourse analysis today, too, so it's kind of a pro. We're talking about forms of speech and um, that kind of analysis, so I think it was appropriate to wear the mask. I hope you're wearing your mask um, diligently and religiously as you go about. I don't have a cool mask, though. I ran into a friend of mine the other day, this biker who had this like, skull and bones mask, which was... Which was kind of cool. Speaking of bikers, right now it's like I'm doing this in the middle of the day and they're like driving me nuts. I happen to live up on a main arterial um, thoroughfare and I gotta deal with them. I start having fantasies of um, grenade launchers because I'd have like this perfect shot from my like front window. Anyway, want to finish up on psychoanalytical criticism. Primarily want to concentrate. I'm um, rounding it off and talking about Carl Jung because I do not feel that um, we have done justice to Jung um, as a thinker, um, at least on the level of Freud. Uh, and we're not going to be able to, but you know, Jung will open up a whole different world when it comes to um, psychoanalytical uh, psycho, psychoanalysis and psychoanalytical criticism that we need to explore. And he is like very, very useful in like analyzing text, um, and also to apply. You know, I find that Jung has been Carl Jung, Carl Gustavus Jung, um, has been an influence in my own thought, my own life, and my own path. So it's like I do want to give him a little bit of attention, but I do want to like go through discourse analysis too. The chapter on discourse analysis. 
I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I feel that discourse analysis as its own discipline kind of takes and borrows from all the other disciplines that we've already talked about. Uh, specifically um, ideological criticism and rhetoric, uh, rhetorical analysis and semiotics. It's like, you know, when we think about discourse analysis, we got to think about it as being this kind of multidisciplinary discipline in its own right, but kind of cobbles from the rest of them. But we'll talk about that when I get to it. Okay, so, and I'm sorry for uh, being a little delayed in uh, putting these up. Um, it's just, I've just been like just juggling, juggling things. I had a bunch of papers come back from the other class, their midterms, and then I'm like kind of wading through your material and uh, I haven't really gotten to it yet, but we'll probably be getting to it like ASAP, either like tomorrow or Monday, um, and getting back uh, grades and looking at that. But that's a lot of material to wade through. And if you haven't gotten your book report up yet, in whatever form it's going to be, whatever multimodal form it's going to be, I would strongly suggest um, getting it up, getting it up there. Because um, for those of you who read your emails, you know that your assignment, and it's a real assignment, this is not a faux assignment. This is not something masquerading as an assignment. It's like a real legitimate assignment that you need to comment on two of your peers um, in, the con in, in the discussion blog with something that, you know, something substantial, not no thumbs up, no, I thought this was great, but, you know, um, and, I, and I put the guidelines up for that. Somewhere between, like, it's got to be a paragraph. And it's got to have some, it can't be cotton candy, it can't be potato chips. It's got to be like, it's got to be like a good meal. It's got to be like meat and potatoes, you know. You got to do that. Um, thumbs up and kudos to those of you who um, decided to join in with our online discussion with Douglas Lane um, from the 240 class, for you guys from the 240 class who showed up for that, that's awesome. I put that on the blog, um, that inter that dialogue with Douglas um, and some other like links to some of his stuff um, that I'm also um, putting out there for you guys for you guys as extra credit to look at the blog to to look at. I was re I was watching it again, and he, he had a lot to say. It was a really good. It was a really really good discussion. And we were talking about this book we're doing in the other class. As some of you have in my image who have taken image theory before have, have read um, Society of the Spectacle and Marxism and COVID nineteen and sci fi stuff. It's like definitely worth like checking out. Um, and then we have our own guest speaker this coming Thursday. Um, bullet point, you know, urgent bullet point. Arthur Berger is going to join us in discussion at 3 p.m. on Thursday, May 30th, and I'm going to set up the collaborate um, setup for that, and I'll probably run a test run with him the day before, but that's like a mandatory attendance, no questions asked, unless you're working, you know, and that will go up on the blog. But since this is a smaller class, I'm going to really stress, so like, be there, you know, be there or, or else. <laughs> or else, you know. Um, so that's going to go on, and we'll talk to Arthur, and you need to send me some questions for Arthur um, as an assignment. Um, I think he wants questions ahead of time so he can kind of scratch his head, and, you know, he's, he's a little older. He's a little older guy. He likes to have things like nice and you know, we'll talk to him about his books and his work, and we've already, you know, gone through a lion's share of this book, so we got a sense of, like, what he's about. Um, that should be a productive conversation on Thursday. Um, as far as reading ahead, it's like I had been saying, um, get uh, Chapter 7 done on Discourse Analysis. That's a short chapter, and I want to, and then Chapter 8 on the interviews, I want to dig in ASAP with a pithy interview, an interview with some, I mean a uh, lecture 
um, talking about interviews, and then I want to post some some other. I want to post some uh, written interviews and some video interviews. Um, one of them, uh, I want to post an interview I did uh, back in I believe it was like February with this guy by the name of Mike Shade, who um, works for uh, an activist group out of Brooklyn called. Uh, Safer, uh, healthy families, safer chemicals, and he had, a lot, he had a lot to say about a lot of what's going on, and so that will be up. And then comment on Lane for extra credit. Um, I think that pretty much rounds off where we are right now. I know we are at April twenty fifth, so we need to start. I need to at least start thinking about what we're going to do for a final project. Um, that's going to be very very open ended and. I don't even, I think that I'm just, I don't know how I'm going to play that yet, you know, let's see, let's, let's see things, how, how things go in the next few days, in the next week or so, so I can kind of, but, I mean, to be honest with you, it's like, I've just been jumping through hoops trying to get work done, I don't, I don't know what other people's situations are, but running around, trying to get, and prepping these lectures is not, it's not, it's, it's, it's hard enough, like, prepping a lecture for a class that you've never taught before, but then having to bring it to your living rooms, um, wherever you may be, um, present some logistical challenges, um, rearranging things in my house to make it happen. And um, so it's a, like, it's a grind. It's a grind. I also, um, so we're going to get back into psycho, psychoanalysis, but I want to talk for a minute about what we're doing in um, image theory right now. Um, we're watching, um, and Doug Lane and I have been talking about it, and he had like suggested it, not knowing that it was on our syllabus. We're watching a documentary series by a British documentary filmmaker by the name of Adam Curtis. And who has become um, very, very um, well known um, and, and prolific as making documentaries about um, the manner in which um, society has been shaped by propaganda and ideology and public relations. And that's kind of this thing. And we're watching his four part documentary series in that class called The Century of the Self. Why do I bring it up? The first episode, and pretty much the entire series, talks about the ways in which Sigmund Freud's overarching ideas about the unconscious and the libido and transfer and, and and all the conceptual dynamics of Freud's thought would have this huge influence on public relations, um, both corporate and in terms of governmental public relations in this country, due to his nephew. He had a nephew in America by the name of Edward Bernays, who became basically the inventor or the the head the arch guru of public relations and advertising in this country and most of his ideas came from his uncle so the idea so i need to i, I just need to contest what berger says about freud um in our in our textbook about I think that Berger has a tendency to minimize what Freud's influence has been on society at large for the last hundred years. And you'll get a piece of that if you watch the um, documentary series. You're going to get a sense of like Freud's true um, influence and import on um, the world. You know, not just this country, but everywhere. That his ideas would be utilized in everything from governmental policy to publicity to corporate management. And he's just like everywhere. He's just everywhere. And um, so I would highly suggest like looking at looking at that um, looking at those lectures and watching that series if you want to learn a little more about Freud and his work and psychoanalysis and all of that. 
It's called Century of the South. Um, it's on YouTube. All four are on YouTube. And um, one of these days I'm going to get Adam Curtis. One of these days I'm going to get him to talk to. I want to get back to Berger's chapter in psychoanalytic theory. And I want to round up um, with Freud. We talked about Freud. We talked about Freud's conceptual framework of developmental psychology and how it was tied to sexual development, the id, the eagle, the superego, the Oedipus complex, all these different coping mechanisms that the eagle has to stay in balance. We talked about all those different strategies of avoidance and transference and projection. And then we went into talking about um, Berger's analysis of smartphone use through the lens of Eric Erickson and this idea of how people are developing develop an identity, this whole um, Erickson schema of um, an individual's maturation, and he tied it to the ways in which we use smartphones and the ways in which... We use them in good ways and we use them in bad ways. It's like, let's be honest about it. You know, there's, they are, they can be a cycle, like anything else. You know, they can be either a tool um, for enrichment or they can be a, a noose or a drug or something, you know, whatever metaphor you want. You know, the noose that you hang yourself with or the syringe that you inject yourself with. To avoid, to avoid life and, and not live. And then uh, Berger talks about Freud's ongoing influence with neuroscience, with brain science, and how um, Freud was kind of looked at with a kind of... Uh, it's like we got to a point where Freud seemed like not applicable anymore. And then, you know, lo and behold, in this, you know, high-tech, you know, um, clinical world of this this incredibly you know I mean the metaphor of like you know I'm not a brain surgeon <laughs> kind of applies to like neuroscience as being this elite like group of um, of academics that you know they, they think they're more elite than they are really but how his findings about the unconscious have started to gain garner renewed interest and with neuroscientists specifically in terms of what they're learning about the brain and the unconscious and doing you know qual doing quantitative experimentation you know Berger talks about the whole study they did about people um, pushing a button or being instructed to push a button and then recording like when they came up with the thought and it and um, it mapping to like a couple a, a, a period before that the that they're exploring the unconscious through behavioral experimentation, you know, and they they're giving a lot more weight to the unconscious than they used to. That these guys that were just kind of looking at gray matter and synapses and all that stuff um, tended to look at. Um, and there, uh, in fact, there's a quote in the book that says that um, from a neuroscientist that said Freud might have not gone far enough on, uh, in terms of understanding the reach that the unconscious has on human behavior. That it might be a lot more of an extensive um, shaper of behavior than we originally thought. So there's Freud's Freud being rethought by neuroscientists and that kind of rounds out Freud. And then we get to Jung. We get to Jung who um, lived, lived you know, was a, a contemporary of Freud's and, and a student of Freud's and Freud was his mentor and there would be and Jung would and like any great drama of, of, of great thinkers and, and artists there's usually you know some period of some period of courtship and then you know the divorce you know the split you know that the recognition of the fact that you know I need to go my own way now in order to 
And the big contention with Freud and Jung was primarily that um, Jung, Jung's conception, Jung's conception of Freud reducing everything to our sexual instincts, our sexual drives, the libido, you know, that kind of force, was not, he felt that it was a very, very limiting conception of what was really going on in the psyche from what he could gather, you know, and, and he would start to publish papers and it would piss Freud off because Freud, you know, ultimately realized like, hey, wait a minute, you're not my boy anymore. You're not my, you know, it's like, I thought we were on, it's like, and Jung would be like, you know, no. You know, it's like, I need to, it's like, you know, I need to <clears throat> think about the psyche in, in, in a larger and more encompassing term, um, way than you're looking at it. And he would go on to work in, in, in very, very deep areas of the psyche. And, and would come up with this idea, and we'll get to it, of the collective unconscious. You know, we had the unconscious. For, you would develop this idea of the unconscious having this collective aspect of it. And we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> First, we're going to talk about this idea that you had about archetypes. What is an archetype? You might you may you may ask. Jung looked at the psyche as being and this time and the idea of Jungian archetypes and the collective unconscious like go hand in hand in Jung's um, understanding of the psyche. That um, we can look at the archetypes as kind of being the content you know, if, if the content of this grand drama, the characters that animate this drama or this economy of the unconscious, you know, either whichever way you want to look at it, this kind of economy of the unconscious or as a kind of drama in which there are formative elements that almost have anthropomorphic qualities to to them. All right, anthropomorphic meaning that they seem to have a life of their own and they seem to um, formulate themselves in, 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 in certain behaviors um, and certain um, character traits and that we all have them. Embedded in this idea of the collected psyche, he would find time and time again that there were these archetypes that he would give names to, all right? And for us, in terms of media study and media analysis, these archetypes um, will be hugely important in understanding um, media, uh, everything from, like, narrative um, work to um, print media, literature, like this whole idea of the archetypes, all right? And archetypes, like... It's just, a, it's just an egghead term for general patterns. Patterns that we continue to see in consciousness over generations. You know, um, Jung will um, contend that this collective unconscious is our racial, species-wide um, unconscious. It's our, it's our racial inheritance. It's not, it's not just about us. It's about our ancestors, our forebears, our parents, that there are these traces that this, this evolution of the unconscious will kind of take the same, it's, it's what is called in academia a kind of structural analysis, that there's a structure to the unconscious that is um, generational and bears on, and this has nothing to do with like reincarnation or anything like that, but other people would certainly make a case for it. But this idea that um, each and every one of us have these archetypes kind of embedded in the conscious and they kind of animate our thought, you know? And it won't just be archetypes that he'll talk about. Um, he'll talk about other things, but this is a good one. 
I pulled up. Like, different... I don't think it's, like, crazy talk to talk to um, discuss the idea that within, within, within each and every one of us, there are different characters, kind of animate, different masks that we wear in different situations, and we can look at them as being a kind of Greek chorus, you know, and we talk, and we'll be talking more about this, you know, like, you know, I'm not, I'm, and this is not about, like, hearing voices, all right, this is not, like, you know, Bon Journal is not hearing voices, you know, don't worry about that, but there is this kind of chorus in our psyche of different characters that we are influenced by and um, take counsel with or try to avoid um, in order to um, go our way. And what Freud, what Jung will call individuate, you know, and it's and he'll have a much more he'll he'll ultimately have a much more um, spiritual slash mystical conception of what a human being is than Freud would. Freud will never really pay a lot of heed to things like religion and things like ultimate goal, ultimate ends of humanity. He was, he, he, you know, he was more. I, I, I don't think that. I'm going on a limb here to, I don't think I'm being presumptuous to say that Freud um, did kind of look at all of that, you know, as there's um, a book of his called Totem and Taboo that says that, you know, religious religious imagery and, 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 that kind, and, and religious beliefs have to do with sublimations of sexual urges and, and you know, I, I think we can call... Freud are like just a card carrying atheist to the day he like kicks out, kicks off, you know. Whereas Jung would be a little more unconvinced about what the psyche really represented and, and what its source was, you know. For a very long period of time, he stayed in that realm of, of man as intelligent animal because he would look at a lot of this stuff as being these kind of instincts. He would talk about instincts a lot. But later on in his career, you know, he will um, start this process of his own... He will, be of the, he will be of the belief that in order to really be of any kind of therapeutic value to anybody else, he started to mine and plunge in to the nature of his own unconscious, you know, through everything from, he would, he, it's, it's a very, very long story, and there's a long history involved, and it's very, very fascinating, and out of that work, it will be his late work, the work that he does when he's really, really old, um, and has already kind of, you know, had to say about certain things that will be the most intriguing and interesting, say, to people, Berger says Berger says he was highly influential on the New Age movement, and that's true. But I think that I'm. It's like New Age when people use New Age as as a descriptor. It's usually you know, it's usually in the derogatory. You know that the people that are just kind of out there. You know, but I think that his influence as a depth psychologist will have huge import on on um, a lot of, you know, very reputable forms of self-actualization, but that you will go and actually delve through meditation, through and through, you know, these kind of these kind of um, initiatory rites that he would see in different cultures. And he would travel around into a lot of tribal cultures to try to understand you know, I mean, he wasn't just kind of sitting in his bedroom coming up, you know, he wasn't just sitting at home, like, contemplating his navel, coming up with these ideas, like archetypes in the collection, collective unconscious. He was traveling the world, you know, going to Africa, going to, going to different, and, and actually, like, living with tribes during periods of, during periods of time, and, and, and embedding himself in other cultures 
to finally formulate these ideas. Hey, wait a minute. It's like you guys have a creation myth like this with all this going on in it. And you guys have all these like heroic tales that always have these. He would see these patterns springing up. And, you know, everything from, you know, from aboriginals in Australia to, like, people in Asia to people in, like, the Congo. Like, people that, for all intents and purposes, could not have possibly had any communication amongst each other, but saw these, like, formative structural similarities and parallels of... And some of it is always uncanny, and we'll talk about, like, the myth of the hero and the different narrative pieces of our creation myths, and how they always seem to have these kind of similar um, ideas embedded in them, you know, um, uh, the, and, and, and religious ideas embedded in them. And he would just see these structural similarities in, like, the narrative elements in all these different cultures. Um, hence this idea that, wait a minute, we're all... We must be tapping into something, whatever this thing is, whatever this reservoir is, it seems like it has a lot more to do with us as a species than it does just little old me. And it has a lot more to do with going way, way back instead of just things of the moment. Things of the moment. So within that, so he would see, like, within the archetypes, he would see, you know, Things that would spring up time and time again, you know, different pieces, different perso different persona that we take on, in different situations, uh, different characters within our own psyche that you know advise us and 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 um, that we um, have commerce with on some in, in, in ways that we don't necessarily understand, and that these archetypes would also. Just like Freud, you know, Jung would put a huge amount of um, credence on the dream life and how these how these archetypes would be animating our dreams, and we'll get into that, you know. But in this in this one, there's this thing called the mandala too that would be very very um, important for he would see, and we see this in a lot of Eastern cultures, this idea. Of um, of the mandala, this kind of religious shape of of the universe, you know that it was very was a practice of like Tibetan and Mahayana Buddhism, you know the, the and, and 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 also in Hinduism. This is, you know there's you know we see mantras, um, not mandala rather, not mantras. Um, time and time and time again, and he'll say like this is like a kind of archetypal rendering of the mind, you know. Um, so that's in the center of this one, and then we have characters like the creator, the sage, you know, the wise man, you know, the old wise man, um, the innocent, you know, he's got, and this one has like riding little red riding hood, the explorer, the rebel, the hero, the wizard, the jester. The seductress, the lover, the caregiver, you know, and for and 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 Jung would, you know, assert that these characters we take on the role of, you know, we all, you know, we're all multifaceted, you know, as the great poet, American poet Walt Whitman said, it's like I contradict myself. I contain multitudes. I contain multitudes, you know, of. Um, you know, we're, we're multifaceted and we partake in this whole drama and play these roles, you know, throughout our lives of the caregiver or the innocent, you know, and that Jung, Jung will contend that, you know, that these are, the, you know, characters that we meet in dreams, you know, characters that, you know, kids will be drawn, you know, creativity, and, the, and, 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 and they are this kind of, the factory workers of our creativity. They're down there in the depths just churning this stuff out and we're kind of like, and then kind of tossing it up, you know, to the front office and we're the front office, we're like, hey, thanks, you know, come up with a good idea, you know, or um, the whole idea of, for instance, something is like, just like fucking with your head, 
you can't figure something out for a while and you're like you, you go at it go at it go at it consciously and then you sleep on it and you know everyone at some time or another you know if you unless you're just a total freaking cretin you know um is going to have these kind of experiences of, of working out a problem and then like letting go of it and it popping up later oh eureka that whole term like you're oh i thought it's like this whole idea, and we talk about that in image theory, that um, we talk about um, a chemist that um, was, um, the, that Jung makes reference to this chemist that was trying to come up with the um, ring, the configuration for the element benzene, the uh, hydrocarbon benzene. He couldn't understand, he couldn't understand. He's like, he was screwing around in the laboratory forever. And then he had this dream and this will be an archetype, this dream of the serpent that eats its own tail. This will be, and an, an it's, it's called, the Euro, in Greek, I think it's called the Euroboros. And it, we see it in tons of creation myths of the idea of a serpent that eats its own, the, the wheel, of the turning wheel of the cosmos. And that after having this dream, this chemist will have, he'll, he'll like, it's a ring. Now I know, you know. The ways in which we are, you know, so this was an example of like just this hardcore scientist being influenced by, you know, myth and his unconscious and these archetypes that spring up, you know, in this in this realm. And I pulled so so we get to the collect so, you know, if the archetypes are the characters, or if the archetypes are the inhabitants, the realm. The place where they have their say is the un the collective unconscious, and I pulled up a couple of different interesting um, images that I uh, looked for, trying to kind of show the topology, the map of like, for instance, where and I'll put a close up up on this. Oh, John, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, different models, right? And we have to understand, you know, and we talk, we've talked a lot about this both here and in image theory, that, you know, models, when we're trying to spatialize something that doesn't occur in space, you know, it's always um, subject to a misrepresentation, and we have to take it for a grain of salt, you know, but within this particular schematic, he's got, like, the self, like the the work of the, the conscious self, you know that you know that which is which I'm conscious of, you know, right here now as I'm talking to you, being you know kind of in the center of this entire huge globe that constitutes you know um, all those hidden layers of ourselves, the collective unconscious. And the and the conscious ego up here in the persona, and we'll talk about these things. We got to talk about persona. We got to talk about the shadow yet, and we have to talk about the anima and the animals. But in these, we see like there's these lines that point to these archetypes, kind of kind of orbiting around like a plant planets orbiting around the sun. You know, this idea of them kind of circulating and bubbling. You know, in the in this in this field, um, and um, um, where where they are in this whole system, and then he'll have this whole idea of projections. Projections will be very important to both Freud and Jung. How we project the conscious and unconscious parts of our of ourselves onto other people or onto other races or onto other groups or onto parents or onto our mates or our friends that we do these projections um, that can often be these mechanisms that we use to not be looking at our own game to not be looking at our own game in a way that would lead to um, something productive you know so I want to stress really, really quickly this whole idea of, once again, this kind of contrast of Jung kind of, with Jung and Freud, of Jung kind of seeing this 
development and evolution going on in this individuation, what he would call individuation, what he would call that process by which we make our stamp on the world and we give our lives, our individual lives, you as a person, you with this life that has been given to you, how you individ, how we, how, and how it's kind of our responsibility and the goal of human life to really become, to rise to this level of personhood as a distinct entity above, you know, alongside with other people who are also doing this form of self-actualization and rising to personhood, you know, which would, beg, which would, you know, it, which would be predicated on the idea that a person you're becoming, as, as you grow and evolve, you are becoming a person. You don't come out as just a person, right? The pers personhood, and the, and the union schema of things, personhood, is something that you struggle and work towards, you know? And, um, and you come out of this, you know, and, and you have, and it's, and it's this drama. And, this, and it's like, and I always kind of try to stress with students, like especially like younger students that, you know, have low self-esteem or whatever. That it's like, you know, you have this, you, 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 you are unto yourself this grand drama, as grand as any president, as grand as any loony, as as grand as any freaking king, as grand as anybody. You know that this is your. It's like we talk about in image theory when we talk about the matrix. You're the one. You're the one, you know, who can make determinations, you know, and, and may or may not ultimately, you know, have some bearings, something that you come up with, you know, some, some conviction that you have, some idea um, that comes from you um, may ultimately tweak the world a little bit or make the world a little better. Or, 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 or even just in your own like in your own life, you know, to be part of the solution, or to be part of the problem, you know, because there's enough mother. Because from where I'm standing, the current state of this whole idea of individuation as a val as an abiding value in modern 2020 has been kicked to the road. Because what I see is a lot of motherfuckers that will do anything that they can to not individuate. You know, and your way, and those people are in my way, and they're in your way, and they're wasting your time. All right, and it's like those are the kind of people you got to avoid. There's a really great book by a guy, by another psychologist by the name of M. Scott Peck, called "The People of the Lie," and it, and, and it's a book that wants to analyze the banalities and of human evil and ignorance. You know, and the ways in which I was talking last um, last um, lecture about avoidance is sometimes necessarily, you know, you get, you start to develop the sense of like, just people that are just dragging your shit down. And their only goal is, is like, are they, are, are, are they entitled to a good life? Yeah, you know, but there's a whole bunch of people out there, I guess we can call them people, that populate our landscape, that seem to have, as their stock and trade, their reason for being, is to like just take other people out. And those people need to be avoided, you know, and sometimes vanquished, you know, and we're seeing a lot of that right now, you know, when so little, and it's like hopefully that little um, prelude that I put on this video from that documentary on you kind of speaks to it. You know, where have we gotten? It's like, with the values that we've been walking around with, where have we gotten? Where has it taken us? You know, as opposed to, you know, becoming educated and like developing these ideas and developing this kind of spiritual or psychological self-esteem once again. You know, um, we took, you know, there was a fork in the road, you know, and, um, you know, now we're like, we're reaping what we sow. We're reaping what we sow. And what, um, what the one therapist in the documentary says about the possibility, and, and, and 
Jung and Freud will both end their lives in a very, very, they'll be very, very pessimistic about things, um, about human nature and our possibilities, because they'll live through these periods of like total savagery with World War One and World War Two and and the, the extermination of the Jews and Hiroshima and just just all this stuff to the point where you know the correct response would seem to be like wait a minute it's like you know this species is like not not you know they're they're on the road to like just you know kind of hanging themselves, you know, and they were very fearful of, and they were very fearful due to the fact that, um, we didn't want to look at certain things. We didn't want to look at certain things. And we'll talk about that. For Jung, it will be the shadow. You know, this idea, and once again, this is another part of his whole depth psychological economy, this idea of the shadow. And this is just another, I thought this one was really cool, although it seemed to be a little bit off about, you know, the the whole map of the, I think it's funny, he's got, this guy's got like Pac-Man people here as the transcendent function. He's got like the, the Pac guy, I'm, I, am I right? Look at it on the, when you get the PowerPoints, just, just tell me, yay or nay, Pac-Man or not, Pac, it's like, and then he has like the outer world, the shadow, the you know, personal, un- the personal unconscious, complexes, and then different forms of the archetype, the great mother archetype. That will be another one for Freud, the great mother archetype that we see animating, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, tribal cultures and and his and, and prehistoric and, and historical cultures that weren't. And once again, we get back to this whole di- idea of patriarchy versus matriarchy. And certainly we see time and time again um, cultures where the feminine was, you know, uh, given its due. He'll talk a lot about um, the myth of the hero. And Virgil will talk a lot about this too as he's writing. Um, that this myth of the hero that continues to Every culture, once again, this whole collective unconscious that no matter where you look through history or around the globe, everyone's got these narratives of the hero. The hero being that individual due to circumstances or whatever that rises you know, to a level of, of greatness and staves off some you know, lesser or minor catastrophe. And we can see the hero play out, you know, in modern, it's like, in in modernity, you know, now it's like the Hollywood industry keeps on pushing out um, uh, superheroes, Marvel and DC, and we seem to be a culture as advanced, as advanced and sophisticated as as we are. It's like we flock to see these this hero story continue to be played out time and time again. You know, um, the hero, you know, and a lot, there's a lot of, li- not a lot of literature, but there's some substantial literature out there that talks about guys like Stan Lee and um, the creators of DC Comics being informed by things like the Gilgamesh myth of Mesopotamia. You know, or or the Hulk being kind of like, oh, the Hulk is kind of like Gilgamesh, or the Silver Surfer is kind of like this, you know, and 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 these franchises will literally go as far as mining mythology, other people's mythologies, for instance, Asgardian mythology, you know, like Thor, um, Thor, and and you know, and even Wonder Woman is like part of this whole kind of M. M- Amazon mythology, you know, and the gods and goddesses, you know, that these these universes are populated with all these art Loki, the trickster, you know, lo, um, and we still and, and, and we're still fascinated. Kids are still fascinated with them. It's like, what is it? You know, one ultimately has to ask ask like, what is the appeal 
of this hero archetype that we continue to play with. You know, and Berger, and we get sophisticated with it, too, and I think we've gotten far more sophisticated with it than Berger wants to give credence to. That um, he makes a point of saying that, you know, the hero was always kind of like, he always overcomes all these traits. He, he, he is of this, like, kind of sterling moral character, and he always, like, rises above situations. But, you know, in post-modernity, I think we see more and more of like the idea of heroes being like having their having their demons, you know, like I don't think the Marvel franchise could would be as successful as if as it has been if it didn't update its characters and give them their weak spots and give them their isms and give them, you know, issues that they did in it necessarily have in the comic books although they did too in the comics it's like for some of you youngins it's like there was like um um a period in uh in the marvel universe and this was like in the 70s dave M M dave michelino one of the writers did this whole story arc in which tony stark iron man battles alcoholism and he won all these awards because finally someone was stepping up and like doing taking a hero and giving him a problem, you know, a human problem. And that was, and that was, and that was like kind of groundbreaking. He won all these, won all, and he got all this critical praise for finally taking a hero and bringing it back down to earth. But there's that whole hero thing. The other, one of the other big elements of, of Jung, and we've talked about this before, and we talk about it in, the, in image theory, is that on top of everything? On top of everything, thing else, he'll say that the psyche, the psyche itself, the structure of the psyche, will have these these binaries like this yin and yang to it that balance each other out of what he called the anima or the feminine aspect of um, the human being and the animus. These are taken from Latin. Or an anima means spirit. That, uh, by the way, in Latin, um, animus would be the um, the the male declension. The male the, the, and anima, the, anything that ends in an a is of the female declension in Latin. You're talking to somebody who took three years of Latin. It was like root canal surgery, right? So, um, but he'll say that it doesn't matter uh, what gender you are. That we both that we all incorporate these two. Um, poles in our nature, the feminine and the masculine, that um, kind of animate our our conscious and our unconscious, and the ways in which he'll he'll talk about how um, the animus of the, the female will have an animus, a, a male component of her psyche that he'll say is usually inherited from the father. I don't want to get you know. I don't necessarily know if that's true or not, but it would seem it would it would bear out, you know, in a nuclear family that you know the the um, and we know numerous cases. Just look around, just and look in your own life. You know, it's like you know the you know the dudes out there. Like look about look at like how you may or may not because I know a couple of like I know at least one of my brothers that's a lot more like my mother than I will ever be, and it's probably more like my mother than my mother was. <laughs> than my mother was and he just doesn't know it you know and um, how we play certain things out you know how we play certain things out um, and um, you know Jung will say once again you know that uh, in order for one to have a kind of healthy um, individuation process we have to give these parts of our psyche their due we have to give these parts of our psyche you know and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand this idea it's like and certainly and certainly in the 21st century it's like you know it's like when we think about everything that goes on in the individuation process of individuals in regards to the ways they play out gender um, you know, through like the trans community or the LGBT community or whatever, whatever, the, whatever it is, you know, these, th this, this kind of letting the floodgates open for this acceptance of the idea that people are 
hermaphroditic in a certain way and, and are attempting to, you know, play and, and, and attempting to find some kind of, that each person is playing out this drama of finding a balance between those two poles, you know, or, or maybe, you know, the unconscious is pushing them to the other pole for whatever reason. That some work needs to be done. Hence, hence a man wanting to become a woman. Hence a woman wanting to become a man. Hence a man wanting to be. It's like from a de- It's like when we when we view the whole LGBT experience in lieu of Jung's ideas on the anima and the animals, it just it just sheds light on so many different aspects of what is like current going currently going on in our culture. And also would explain like the resistance there, the resistance of you know people. You know, you talk about you know people that have come, and, and then you know here comes Freud talking about denial and repression, and you know not recognizing you know one's true nature. You know, or or you know like for instance like just like clot people that are closeted in the homosexual community. You know, you know that. For whatever reason, you know, they got a patriarchal, whatever it is, you know, these things that play themselves out and are attempting to um, find some um, equilibrium, you know, and, and, and these things within us that need to express themselves for one reason or, or another, you know, and expression and self expression isn't always pretty. Self-expression isn't always, as we've learned from Freud, it's not always about, you know, and this is where the shadow will come in. The shadow. Who knows the hearts of men? You guys don't even remember. There was this radio hero called the shadow. Jung will, in, in Jung's individuation process, he will like see time and time again this idea, this complex that we have of the shadow um, that we all carry around in us. And if we, it, and it would probably correspond if we needed it to correspond with something. It would probably be in 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 Freud. It would be the it that there is this instinctual um, drive, and a lot of people after Jung and Freud will do, will work on this to try to understand um, a famous um, Freudian, a, a guy that was highly influenced by Freud, a guy by the name of Jacques Lacan, will do a lot of work with this, with these ideas of the id and how they're animating society and, and that's, another, that's another world altogether but the idea of, the, of a shadow a kind of dark side to our nature that we often want to bury or repress in some way, or, um, you know, I mean, Jung's prescription for how to deal with the shadow would ultimately be to recognize it, to recognize it and make some kind of alliance with it, to recognize this dark shit that you've got going on in your own psyche, you know, these unresolved problems or these fantasies of violence or sexual, whatever it is, and instead of just like keeping it like a pressure cooker until you know it's like you know and we see tons of this in like Hollywood is playing with this shit like it was no tomorrow lately the shadow you know we see it in like in all, it's like the Joker you know that movie the Joker um, you know of somebody who is in this battle with this sh- his shadow you know, and he just, and he's like trying to hang on to it, you know, and he's like, these reaction formations of just laughing hysterically as a reaction formation against the repression of the shadow, you know, and finally it just coming out in this depraved way, you know, and we have to understand that, you know, once again, these guys came up through the period of Nazi Germany, and they understood this idea, especially Jung understood this idea that Entire nations and groups of people would have a part of their shadow that they did not want to deal with, that they would project. Instead of dealing 
with the problem in your own backyard, with your own shadow, we have a tendency to want to project that shadow, like a big spotlight. We want to project that shadow. Uh, in our own personal lives, we will project that shadow on all kinds of people if we're not dealing with it directly, right? Um, we'll project it on our, on our mate. We'll project it. It's like, and that we'll have all these characters that, you know, once, once we get real and understand, and once we get to some plateau of self-understanding, you know, that hopefully come into college and, and, and take primarily taking my classes, not of my classes. Um, but you get to this plateau of being equipped with enough, um, information and enough of a conceptual worldview that um, you can start to do that work yourself on your on, on yourself and deal and, and, and deal with these things and come out better and happier human beings without you know having you know in recovery circles we call it like we used to say shit like anger coming out sideways you know and um, and the shadow manifests itself in all kinds of ways you know it's like I mean, it's not just the bit, it's not just project, you know, like, now it's like the shit, it's like, you know, now, you know, us fucking moronic Americans, both liberal and, and conservative, have decided we're going to project the shadow on China, the sleeping giant, you know, it's like, it's like, we always got to blame someone, always got to blame someone, unless you're willing to start dealing with your own shit. And your own misdeeds, as an individual and as a and as a nation, you're going to continue to play this game, all right? And this game that we're playing, we know what happens. You know what happens with this game? It generates millions of cadavers. That's what it's done in the past. That's what it's going to do again, unless we start dealing with it. Unless we start dealing with with it as a society and in our own hearts and minds and start stepping up and talking about it. It's going to just go on over and over again because it's like the talk we had with Douglas Lane. God forgive me for talk, for saying it. You know, that, you know, there's a very, very real scenario of us needing another world war in order to balance the economy again. All right? This is not a pleasant thing to talk about, my friends. You know, we need to do everything within our collective power to, like, not make that happen. There's already, an, there's already been enough death. There's already enough cadavers in the last couple months. We don't need a couple million more. So this idea of us... So these ideas that Freud and Jung had continue to be very, very fruitful in, in, in being able to talk about our society and ourselves. And then I put a long quote here um, from Berger's book. Somebody paraphrasing like, For Jung, as for Freud, a basic part of his analytical process was based upon dream analysis, and he published extensively on this topic. Jung also considered and defined the process of individuation as the path to individual self-knowledge. According to Jung, everyone has an innate desire to achieve the self-realization and the prevention of this from external influences, from other people in close contact with the individual or from societal pressures, is the root cause of an individual's dysfunctional behavior. According to Jung, a person's personality can be described in terms of the persona, and we haven't really touched upon that. The persona is like, and the shadow. The, pers the persona representing the mask, which mediates between a person and the world. The shadow representing the part of the personality which the individual will not allow himself or herself to express. You know, the persona can be defined as the fit. It's like, you know, you got all kinds of crazy, especially when, you know, you know, wherever, you know. It's like you have all kinds of crazy shit going on in your mind before you leave the bedroom. Or then it's like once you go out into the street, you put on the persona, which is this, you know, 
I mean, it's not disingenuous, but it's this, it's this mask we literally like this mask. Now we like actually put mask on. Um, it's this mask we put on in order to be civil and deal with other people, and it's what we project out there. You know, this is me. This is Bon Journal. This is Frank. This is you know, this is me, Harriet, being Harriet. You know, it's like you know, there's all these like. Aren't these all, all, all these like kind of like chick flick series now? They're always about like, you know, being Julia or but what whatever. But it's like you know, this is the you know being that guy, right? And and representing the part of the personality which the individual will not allow himself. An individual also has both a masculine and a feminine side la- labeled anima and animus. For a man, the masculine side is the resident conscious mind with the anima being present in the unconscious. While for a woman, the reverse is the case. In her later career, in his later career, that was a Freudian slip, in his later career, Jung became extremely interested in and knowledgeable concerning the religions, myths, and rituals of primitive societies. And as a result, after his break with Freud, he became more concerned with the interpretation of society rather than individual society. He wanted to see the bigger picture. Much of his later work has a mystical aspect of it. That it's like, you know, Berger sees almost frames it as being a bad thing. I don't know. Um, to it, and the aspect of his work has led to a resurgence in popularity in Jungian psychology in recent years among alternative communities. Indeed, the psychology of Jung provides much of the foundations for New Age spirituality. And I'm just going to end with the, it's I'm just gonna end with this. I had this. It's like Bonjour. It's like Bonjour is really not even. I used to love Kiss when I was a kid, but I gotta tell you guys about this. You know, in in the realm of dreams, I had this dream like a couple weeks ago where I for for whatever reason I'm reached out to by this Kiss cover band. This Kiss cover band reaches out to me like they need somebody to stand in for them. They need a sup, and they come to me of all all people. Like we need, it's like uh, it's a dream, and I'm supposed to be Ace Fraley, right? And um, but they don't tell me. And then they and then I go down there, and it's like this high school auditorium. There's a couple. It's like it's like wrestling or something, right? And it's nothing's really right. And a friend of mine is trying to put the makeup on me, and it's all going wrong, and I'm really worried because I'm supposed to be on stage. And um, and then I'm like, and then it's like I hear the audience, and I'm trying to put, I'm struggling with this like black spandex outfit, trying to get it on. And um, and then they tell me like they they ignore me, like don't worry about it, we don't need you, we don't need you to sit on the sidelines. So I remember like in the dream, I. I'm like, I'm watching them. They're doing it all wrong, too. They're not. They're in, like, suits and stuff. I, I don't even know. But I'm sitting there with my father in in the backstage, sitting there, and the thought arises, like, my, my father, who's deceased, sits there and asks me, like, are you getting paid for this? Are they still paying you? <laughs> and then I pull, and I find the check, and it's, like, and it's for, like, $82. And my father, in the dream, my father is, like, bitching about, like, it's too low, it's too low, you know, so, that's my journal's dream. That was just, no, we will not, let's break into discourse analysis, why I have a few minutes here, why I have just a couple of minutes, want to talk about discourse analysis, what we're going to find with discourse analysis in this chapter is the fact that we're going to find that discourse analysis, we're going to need to define it in terms of some of the other analysis that we've done. That, for all intents and purposes, discourse analysis has to do with looking at language, the way, not necessarily the content of language, but the way in which we use language stylistically. Um, and it's an analysis. It's an it's an, an analysis. Discourse analysis has to do with what a famous philosopher by the name of Ludwig Wittgenstein called language games. 
language games. Are, ultimately, that's what discourse analysis is. And, and Foucault would be a big guy on discourse, even though he's not considered a discourse analysis guy as such. Berger defines discourse, um, he pulls out the Merriam-Webster dictionary um, definition for it, and he defines it as um, an archa uh, archaic, meaning old, the capacity of orderly thought or procedure, rationality, verbal interchange of ideas, especially conversation. Discourse has a lot to do with with, it's not about you know a one side. It's not one sided. It has to do with the inner. It has to do with the relation, with relationships that are based on speech, the way that relate and the way that the world is constructed. They want to talk uh, discourse analysis. Want to say and once again we're back into this whole idea of socially constructed meaning, that the world as such that we live in is ultimately a product of what we call it, or what we say about it, or what we believe to be true and what we believe not to be true. You know, and that and belief systems will have a lot, will be like part of the field of discourse, understanding belief systems. Um, formal, orderly use, extended expression of thought on a subject, connected speech or writing, a linguistic unit, as a conversation or a story, larger than a sentence, all right, and Berger will stipulate that discourse analysis isn't, there are other, there are other places that we've already talked about, rhetoric, semiotics, that has to do with symbols, discourse doesn't want to look at that, linguistics, that wants to look at structural relationships of language and words, and etymology, and, 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 and look at things at the level of the sentence, right? If, if, linguistics, if linguistics wants to look at things on the level of a sentence, discourse analysis wants to look at things in terms of an ongoing dialogue. We can almost say it's dialogue analysis. It's this dialogue, and it will play itself out in advertising, in politics, um, and the dialogic aspect of it is like, for instance, the dialogue that a consumer has with an advertisement, right? That discourse analysis wants to uncover those, um, those dynamics and those relationships primarily, and it wants to stay away from vis the visual. It kind of like has like kind of carved out its own niche in like just looking at like written language and spoken language. And then we'll talk about this whole idea of like multimodal discourse analysis, which is, you know, looking at like tax and relationship with pictures. In their book, Working with Written Discourse, Deborah Cameron and Ivan Panovich suggested that discourse has three basic themes. One, discourse is language above the sentence, meaning that we're not talking about subject, predicate, descriptors, adjectives, all that stuff you learned in early ELA. We're talking about looking at it above the sentence, the structures, the styles, all right? So in a lot of ways, it kind of, you know, is the bastard cousin to rhetoric. You know, because what is rhetoric? Discursive, once again, strategies of expression, right? Discourse is language in use. A lot of emphasis is put on the idea of it being language as we use it, the way I'm talking to you right now. You know, that I have a style that isn't necessarily always um, this kind of stuffy, stuff sure. Like, no one would mistake me for, like, Professor ha uh, John Hausman's um, <laughs> character on Paper, Shape, Paper Chase, his Harvard professor. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm a lot cooler than them. I'm a lot cooler than, you know. Um, uh, discourse is language in use. You know, think back in semiotics when we were talking about Saussure and um, Levi-Strauss and this idea of, like, language as it is on the page or language as it is in a French book and language as we speak it, right? Discourse is a form of social practice in which language plays a central role. It's about the ways that language shapes society, the way we speak with each other, 
you know, and the ways in which it shapes society. You know, think about the ways in which, think about the ways in which, for instance, you start a fight with some. It's like, you know, we, it's like sometimes we end up in an argument with someone that didn't start, start out as an argument, but we took a certain position on something or we said something to piss the other person off or we poked at some scab that we didn't know that they had and, you know, sometimes it gets physical, you know? Or the ways in which, for instance, we talk on a date, you know? That's like, that's a fertile ground to analyze this. Things we say, things we don't say. This And, you know, there's tons of, like, beautiful rom-coms that tackle this in brilliant ways, you know? It's like, you know... You should have said this, you know, you should, it's like, um, discourse is a form of, okay, so we got that. He brings up, um, a fairly recent guy who's still living, a guy by the name of Tum, uh, I think it's pronounced, uh, Tum, Van Diet, um, and, uh, he's become kind of on the forefront of discourse analysis, um, yeah, Van Dyck describes discourse as uh, in three different modes, in three different modalities. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this slide. Lang- uh, A, language use, the way we use it or misuse it, as the case may be. You know, going through some of your papers, I'm painfully aware of some misuses. <laughs> some misuses of language. Um B, the communication of beliefs in, and in parentheses, cognition. The communication of beliefs. Things that we think, that we believe in, right? The ways in which our, so, our world is shaped by what we say about it or what we don't say about it. Um, and then C, interaction in social situations. Once again, you know, talking about, it's like, you know, and the different thing, it's like, you know, when you're with your friends down on the stoop, you're like, you know, you're talking shit, you know, you're going at, like, you know, you guys got these in-jokes, you know, or or stupid memes that, you know, you t- say with each other, or, you know, it's like, and, it's like and, and, and males and females are different with this, with the styles, you know, um, that can be said. And also, uh, um, given these three dimensions, it is not surprising to find that several disciplines are involved in the study of discourse, such as linguistics, for the specific study of language and language use. Psychology. Of course, there's going to be some psychological components in this thing to understand because, you know, discourse ultimately comes from the psyche, you know, um, and the social sciences for analysis of interactions in social situations. Sociology, you know, um, and even history too. We, have, you know, it's like when somebody like Jerry Smith, who was supposed to, you know, speak for us, looks at a document from like the 1800s or whatever. You know, you have to do. It's like a discourse analysis might involve looking at the way somebody spoke, you know, a hundred or a thousand years ago, as opposed to the way they speak now. It is typically the task of discourse studies to provide integrated descriptions of these three main dimensions of discourse. How does language... Let me repeat that. It is typically the task of discourse studies to provide integrated descriptions of these three main dimensions of discourse. How does language use... Discourse, how does language use influence beliefs and interaction or vice versa? Vice versa. How do aspects of interactions influence how people speak or how do beliefs control language use and interaction, right? Moreover, besides giving systematic descriptions, we may expect discourse studies to formulate theories that explain such relationships between language use, beliefs, and interaction. And they put a lot of stress, and especially guys like Van Dyck will put a lot of stress in the ideas that this is a discipline. This is a science, you know, that they want to. It's a social science, but it has these discipline, it has these um, these epistemological underpinnings that are like primarily scientific. We want to find patterns, codifiable patterns 
in this for particular phenomena so that we can apply laws to it so that we can find we can find laws and models that um, we can use as descriptors in any given situation which is what is what all science does anyway so I gotta go to the bathroom it's one it's like I'm looking at 117 on this this one's gonna run specifically long because of that like prelude that you should look at look at the lane discussion get ready for Berger Berger's coming Berger's coming folks Woo-hoo! We'll see you next time.